practice that they are trying to offer us. In Dark Water of 1920, W.B. Du Bois offers an incisive commentary on the meaning of democracy. Against those who would restrict the franchise, he remarks, quote, such arguments show so curious a misapprehension of the foundation of the argument for democracy that the argument must be continually restated and emphasized as Du Bois. The statement is arresting given the historical setting. These words were penned by an African American in the 1920s at a time when the insecurity of black life the insecurity of black life was constantly on display, a period in which, despite the Civil War amendments, Jim and Jane Crow were the law of the land, and lynching was a daily reminder of how easily one could be disposed of with impunity. That the case for democracy must be restated amid its distorted expression raises an important question that I think haunts the struggle for racial equality and indeed the very legitimacy of the American polity. What is it about democracy that justifies our faith, especially the faith of African Americans in it? Given the frequency with which African Americans are killed by police, the ongoing problems of economic inequality they experience, and the general sense that from city to city and state to state, Black people are subject to a fundamental insecurity, not chiefly of their own making. It is difficult to suggest that commitment is or has been justified at all. It may seem more appropriate to interpret the United States as working according to plan, connecting the horror of the earliest periods of African American life to the present moment in one story about the nation's presumed foundational commitment to anti-blackness. Writing, for example, in response to the 2012 killing of Trayvon Martin, journalist Tanihichi Coates describes Martin's killing as the natural consequence of the functioning of American society. This is what Coates writes. When you have a society that takes as its founding the hatred and degradation of a people, when the society inscribes the degradation in its most hollow document and continues to inscribe hatred in its laws and policies, it is fantastic to believe that its citizens will derive no ill messaging. It is painful to say this. Trayvon Martin is not a miscarriage of justice, but American justice itself. This is not our system malfunctioning. It is our system working as intended, end quote. You just gotta sit with that for a minute. Right? Little can be denied in this, I think, and we might add other voices who are trying to get us to see that anti-blackness functions as a precondition for American progress. As philosopher Calvin Warren tells us, quote, it is the humiliated, incarcerated, mutilated, and terrorized black body that serves as the vestibule for the democracy to come, end quote. Warren stands in a tradition of thinking known as Afro-pessimism that includes scholars such as Jared Sexton and Frank Wilderson, and I think more recently Christina Sharp, all view the persistence of racial inequality and the vulnerability of black life as the inescapable afterlife of slavery. They raise the haunting suggestion that modernity, by which is meant that period running roughly from the glorious revolution to the American and French revolutions, that modernity specifies what they call an ontology that requires a referent outside itself for its conceptualization of identity, freedom, and progress, that requires an other for freedom, equality, and progress to be realized. This ontological framework in which African Americans work, live, and struggle leads, as Juliet Hooker and Bernard Hess tell us, to a fundamental conundrum, this is the, their words, quote, one of the fundamental paradoxes of black politics is the invariable futility of directing activism toward a racially governing regime historically founded on the constitutive exclusion and violation of blackness, end quote. Now, it is fashionable these days, and understandably so, to wear one's despair on one's sleeve if we are honest with ourselves, if we are honest, how could we do otherwise? Moments of hope have 
often been dashed by the cold and cruel reality of American life, it is no wonder we find it hard to stabilize our faith in a racially just society. Here in brief is the sample of this history. In the wake of black Americans' participation in the American Revolution, the nation witnessed a slow denial of their standing and contribution to the polity. With the ongoing development of slavery in the South, Northern states in the 19th century slowly rescinded rights that had previously been extended to African American, African American men. Although the Civil War Amendment sought to recognize the equal status of blacks, that recognition was effectively denied by the ascendancy of, of debt, peonage, economic exploitation, lynching, and Jim and Jane Crow. The Civil Rights Movement killed Jim and Jane Crow, but the policing and subordination of blacks was reconstituted through the rise of the carceral state, the underdeveloped welfare state, and the underfunded public education system that has been exacerbated by residential segregation. Whatever one might think of his success, the fact remains that the election of the first black president has been followed by Donald Trump, who defines his success based on removing any trace of its previous occupant. Trump's success was, without exaggeration, cultivated through the tropes of white supremacy nativism and the commitment to police black and brown populations. Claims of white supremacy's death of the post-racialism supposedly evidenced by the ascendancy of Barack Obama to the presidency have proven premature, yes? At precisely this moment, however, we must confront some crucial questions. Is American democracy constitutionally at odds with our goals, or might it be conducive to build in a society in which we all can live equally and at peace with one another? Are there normative resources on which one can rely to advance affirmative claims regarding racial equality, resources that are distilled not by, not by denying the ontology specified above, but by disclosing its competing alternative? Or must the resources of modern democracy remain forever premised on anti-blackness? Admittedly, these appear to be empirical questions that depend on history, or do they? In our historical calculus, we might emphasize the reconstitution of white supremacy, but we could just as easily emphasize the ways in which it has been foiled through multiple waves of racial inclusion. Those who embrace the former as our true racial reality find themselves trying to prove to those of us who have benefited from racial struggle while our success is illusory or at best temporary. But those who locate America's identity and its resistance to white supremacy have another problem. They are often unable to see the evidence of systemic racism, or they readily describe it as anomalous, foreign to the structure of our institutions and culture. If the first position seems unsatisfying because it denies human agency and gives the past too much power over the present and future, the second risk turning a blind eye to the ways white supremacy is often bolstered by institutional support and state-sanctioned violence that emanate from a culture that disregards again and again black life. Both sides, I think, fail to distinguish between the somewhat different tasks of studying the past and narrativizing the past in a way that is useful for moving society in an auspicious direction. In Frederick Douglass's felicitous formulation of the matter, quote, we have to do with the past only as we can make it useful to the present and to the future, end quote. These words come from Douglass's famous 1852 address, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. In that address, he does not dismiss the past. Rather, he stands in a line of thinkers who see in America's past a vital principle that is both visionary and realistic. Similar to early 19th century abolitionist David Walker before him and James Baldwin well after him, Douglas deploys the principle of making and remaking that underwrites the American polity, what we political theorists call the constituent power of the people that is part and parcel of the central properties of democracy. The idea of the people Douglas knows all too well forms part of the tradition of American life, sitting alongside and often used to combat the white supremacist tendencies of the American polity. And Douglas, I think, retrieves this principle from the past, and he counsels his fellows to place it in the service of the present and the future. Now, for Douglas, African Americans may often be alienated 
from American society, but they are not alien to it. This point is of great significance when you consider the thread running through much of African-American thinking, a struggle that seeks to make America a racially just polity. They see their efforts as emerging from within and forming part of the, the very complex traditions of America's moral and political language. Like them, Douglass's aim is to emphasize those portions of the tradition that might yet deepen and extend democracy against those portions that will constrain democracy's meaning and reach. The meaning of America, its past and its future is for Douglas something over which to struggle. But he sees struggle as an emergent property of the contested notion of who comprises the people that is central to democracy's self-understanding. So the question of what America really is, it seems to me, defies articulation even as we struggle to say something substantive about our ethical and political identities. This is simply because we cannot get on with figuring out where we should go and who we ought to be without narrating the past to which we belong. But worrying, I think, too much about offering the true description or final narrative of that past may miss the point. We ask questions of the past, who are we really? Less to understand our identity once and for all and more to aid in us making decisions about who we should become. This is the aspirational quality of the American imagination, indeed the aspirational core on which African Americans have often relied to make sense of their appeals to the nation. This is, I believe, the perfectionist or romantic register on which many in this tradition have often worked, including Douglas himself. So for the remainder of my remarks, I want to spend some time trying to retrieve the meaning and complex power of this aspirational vision, believing that it is during moments of dark times, such as our current moment, at least for me, I think, that we need to recall the faith of those that came before. But just as we have in our current moment powerful reasons to lose faith and powerful reasons to believe in what the Afro-pessimists offer us, Douglas had in his time a powerful alternative vision confronting his own. It is with that vision we must now begin. On the evening of December 13th, 1850, the faculty of Harvard's medical school met at the house of then Dean Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. to discuss various petitions regarding the admission of three African Americans and one woman to the school. Although Holmes had already granted admissions to the students and the men would be allowed to attend for a semester, the woman had already withdrawn, it was ultimately deemed, quote, inexpedient, this is Holmes, after the present course to admit colored students to attendance or medical lectures, end quote. Explaining his position, Holmes said in a letter of 1850, quote, the faculty is now convinced that the intermixing of the white and black races in their lecture rooms is distasteful to a large portion of the class and injurious to the interests of the school, end quote. Holmes was expressing and affirming views articulated in an earlier resolution by a majority, passed by a majority of the students. Here is what the students said in their resolution, quote, Whereas blacks have been admitted to the lectures of the medical department of Harvard University, therefore resolved that we deem the admission of blacks to the medical lectures highly detrimental to the interests and welfare of the institution of which we are members calculated alike to lower its reputation in this and other parts of the country to lessen the value of the diploma from it and to diminish the number of its students resolved that we cannot consent to be identified as fellow students with blacks whose company we would not keep in the streets and whose society as associates we would not tolerate in our houses." End quote. Martin Delaney, one of the four admitted students, left Harvard Medical School in March of 1851. He was not permitted to return. Only a few months earlier, September of 1850, the United States Congress passed the Draconian Fugitive Slave Act, an act that strengthened the earlier Fugitive Slave Act of 1793. In response to the 1793 law, states such as Indiana and Connecticut, in response to the 1793 law, 
States such as Indiana and Connecticut made the right of jury trial upon appeal possible for escaped slaves, while states such as Vermont and New York provided escaped slaves with attorneys, as well as making the jury trial a legal right. The 1850 law, as I understand it, essentially destroyed all such possibilities, effectively denying the standing of slaves even in free states, while also adding harsh penalties for those who either failed to enforce the law or who helped slaves to escape. In Delaney's mind, these moments, these two moments mingled. They each were a piece of a general logic of seeing African Americans as an inferior race. And in response, Delaney argues for immigration in his signature text, which we don't read very much anymore. The Condition, Elevation, Immigration, and Destiny of the Colored People of the United States, published in April 1852, this text represents a powerful indictment of American life. Delaney's argument for immigration emanates from a belief that the ethos of the polity, its culture, depends on the domination of black Americans. This is what he tells us, quote, we are politically not of them, but alien to the laws and political privileges of the country. These are truths, fixed facts that quaint theory and exhaustive moralizing fall harmlessly before, end quote. But there is something else at work in forming Delaney's position. Political life, he thinks, is merely the attitudinal expression of the underlying ethos of the people. Delaney again, among the whites, their color is made by law and custom the mark of distinction and superiority, while the color of the blacks is a badge of degradation acknowledged by statute, organic law, and the common consent of the people. With this view of the case, which we hold to be correct, to elevate to equality the degraded subject of law and custom, it can only be done by an entire destruction of the identity of the former condition of the applicant. Now by identity here, Delaney has in mind the identity that is ascribed to African Americans by virtue of their race, what he calls the badge of degradation that is instantiated and acknowledged by the political, legal, and cultural life of American society. The identity of white Americans partly comes about, or so Delaney suggests, by virtue of this contrast with their darker counterparts. To overcome this condition requires that one destroy the badge of degradation, but this also involves significantly a willingness by white Americans to destroy the legal and customary badge of superiority they now flaunt. They must be willing to destroy who they take themselves to be. This would mean in Delaney's mind the overthrow of the American polity as it is currently constructed. Delaney connects ethos and politics together in a way that continues, I think, to haunt us today. He wants us to think that there is no meaningful distinction between the constituent power of the people, the idea of making and remaking, and its constituted form. And he wants us to believe that the people's cultural identity and its political identity cannot be separated and nor could they be, can they be transformed, even as he insists that the latter ought to be understood as a means by which the former is politically consolidated. Now this is a bit of vocabulary from political philosophy, but most of us, I hope, may recognize the meanings. Constituent power, the power of the people, is the power, once again, for making and remaking society. The constituted expression, the government, its laws and institutions, derives its existence from this power. In other words, the government forms the channel through which the agental energy of constituent power moves. This is how it is typically understood. Constituent power functions as an autonomous domain that can be inhabited by anyone but never finally colonized. The constituent power of the people seemingly stands apart from constituted power, giving it direction all the while preventing constituted power from finally speaking in the name of the people. But for Delaney, the identity of the American people has no distinct or prior political existence. Its political harmony is found in the harmony of a constitutional order that materially manifests its otherwise fixed ethical life. This way of proceeding is what allows Delaney in 1852 to view the Fugitive Slave Act as he does 
And it is what allows Coates, Talihishi Coates in 2013, from the quote cited earlier, to say, once again, Trayvon Martin is not a miscarriage of justice, but American justice itself. This is not our system malfunctioning, it is our system working as intended. Delaney's view opened an important disagreement between him and Douglas. Here's what Delaney says of his position to William Lloyd Garrison in 1852. Listen to this language. I am not in favor of caste nor a separation of the brotherhood of mankind and would as willingly live among white men as blacks if I had equal possession and enjoyment of privileges. Blind selfishness on the one hand and deep prejudices on the other will not permit them to understand that we desire the exercise and enjoyment of rights. If there were any probability, if there were any probability, I should be willing to remain in the country fighting and struggling on. But I must admit that I have no hope in this country, no confidence in the American people with a few excellent exceptions. Douglas responds a year later to this sentiment. We don't object to colonizationists because they desire the prosperity of Liberia, but it is because, like Brother Delaney, like Brother Delaney, they have not sufficient faith in the people of the United States to believe that the black man can never get justice at their hands on American soil. There are two themes I would like to highlight from these passages that I will say more about shortly. The first is a slide from hope in Delaney's thinking to faith in Douglas's. The second bears on the invocation of the people found in Douglas's passage. So let me take each in turn. The language of hope and faith are not synonyms. Hope, as Patrick Shade notes, is a, quote, active commitment to the desirability and realizability of a certain end. It appears for Delaney that hope is tied to confidence and bringing to fruition what one desires. As he suggests, hope stands within the world of probabilities informed by facts that provide indications of what is possible. We must abandon, he tells us, this is Delaney, all vague theory and look at facts as they really are, viewing ourselves and our true political position in the body politic. But he takes those facts, at least in 1852, which is where I'm focusing, to be exhaustive not only of what is, but what may be. In contrast to hope, faith is a passionate conviction, coterminous with a vision of life or object not in existence. Now both hope and faith are tied to something not yet in existence, but the source of the difference between the two is that hope marks levels of confidence in achieving what is desired, while faith is the expression of a loving, even if difficult, commitment precisely because there is no confidence to be had, at least based on some facts of the matter, in its realization. This at least appears to be one take on how these things fit together. Delaney not only dispenses with hope because there is no evidence to sustain it, but more significantly his without faith that there is a narrative of American and African American life that can provoke whites to change, to dispense with the status they seemingly enjoy by virtue of being white. In contrast, all Douglas has, in my estimation, is faith. In his 1852 address, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, Douglas holds fast to the idea that he can put the revolutionary spirit of 1776 in the service of a racially just society that has never before defined American life. He thinks that inhabiting the revolutionary spirit and putting it in the service of a racially just society will be so compelling that his fellows will want to take it up. He holds fast to this even as he claims, quote, America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future, end quote. This declaration should not be taken too far, since the rhetorical context is that Douglas often declares things to be the case as a means to stimulate an alternative option, alternative position. Still, he says it. Admittedly, sometimes it is Douglas's religious commitments at work in forming his faith Writing in the wake of the Dred Scott decision, he tells us that Justice Taney, quote, may decide and decide again, but he cannot reverse the decision of the Most High. He cannot change the essential nature of things, making evil good and good evil, end quote. 
Other times, it is Douglas's vision of human nature that underwrites his faith. Quote, while man is constantly liable to do evil, he tells us in 1851. <laughs> I don't want to listen to him. Please, I got something for you. So while man is constantly liable to do evil, he is still capable of apprehending and pursuing that which is good. This is Douglas's sort of vision of human nature, right? But more consistently, I think, it is faith in a specific idea of America. Whatever is hoped for seems to have no other ground than this idea. Returning to his Fourth of July address, quote, I therefore leave off where I began with hope. While drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principle it contain, principles it contains, and the and the genius of American institutions, end quote. And he repeats the same sentiment in the Dred Scott speech of 1857. For Douglas, hope and faith come together in a way similar to Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Douglas's account of faith is tantamount to a vision of political and ethical life that is at variance with the community he inhabits, what America fails to be true to, that he hopes will command allegiance precisely because he believes it ought to guide our lives and for which he is willing to fight to bring into existence. Now this view marks an important difference, I think, between Delaney and Douglas, and I think between those who are pessimists regarding racial transformation and those who are keepers of the faith. Delaney treats the facts of racial domination, as he calls them, as capturing the world as it really is in itself. He thinks those facts are expressive of a deeper historical logic that is playing itself out in the United States. As he writes in Condition, quote, that there have been in all ages and in all countries classes of people who have been deprived of equal privileges. These are historical facts that cannot be controverted, end quote. And just as Delaney ontologizes history, we might say, we see a similar move in someone like Tanahishi quotes, Douglas rejects this kind of thinking. He refuses to remove the human element from the facts of American history. And he thinks that since the human element isn't the kind of thing that is fixed once and for all, there is no reason to think that the future need only be a replication of the past. To recall a line cited earlier from Douglas's 1851 essay, Is Civil Government Right? While man is constantly liable to do evil, he is still capable of apprehending and pursuing that which is good. Now, I often think of Anna Julia Cooper and the other American pragmatists as defending this account of faith and holding this view of human beings as unfinished creatures. Its importance is heightened in dark political times and explains why Douglas's faith remains important. Anna Julia Cooper tells us that faith is neither a proper interpretive enterprise of scripture nor a process of stabilizing theological certainties. She was religious, but she was uninterested in having the logic of faith confined to religion. And she argues in a voice from the South of 1892 that faith involves submitting oneself to a vision of life that one projects into a world at odds with that vision and for which one is willing to act in the service of. We hear the echo of this position in William James in 1897. In his account, faith need not be at odds with the world, but its end is in no way assured, quote, faith is the readiness to act in a cause the prosperous issue of which is not certified to us in advance. This is why someone like John Dewey insisted that there is a difference between, quote, quote belief that is a conviction that some end should be supreme over conduct and belief that some object exists as truth for the intellect. By this, Dewey explicitly intended to treat certain kinds of beliefs as imaginative possibilities that political actors believe ought to organize the lives of their fellows and in which they invest their energies. But in seeking to convert one's faith into a matter of intellectual assent, a feature of political reality here and now, think of Delaney or Coates, we often reject faith as a precondition for political engagement in the first place. So in thinking about faith in this way, I do not mean to suggest that faith is indisciplined. And I do not mean to suggest that it's not even humbled. Faith talk is often assumed to be a species of irrational thinking. I tend to think this way of understanding the matter is mistaken precisely because people don't understand 
how faith, in fact, is disciplined. But faith is disciplined because the vision of life faith holders offer is often distilled from the bits and pieces of the social and political community's language that is then reconfigured, unified, and projected into a new form of life that we may yet inhabit. African-American thinkers and activists, it seems to me, who stand with Douglas, often organize the language of struggle and appeal in such a way to disclose new meanings regarding its reach. They have reworked, for example, the interior logic of freedom so that it did not merely mean denial of political standing, of a political standing one previously enjoyed. Think about the American colonists. But also meant denial of the very idea that one was fit for freedom in the first place because of a lack of human capacities. This enabled some to see that addressing the condition of black people in the United States would take more than legal and political changes, that's what the American colonists needed, but a deep transformation of culture in which negative and debilitating images of black people and their capacities circulated. What Ida B. Wells famously referred to as, um, as the sort of unwritten laws that police black and brown uh, life. David Walker, for example, a 19th century abolitionist engaged in this reworking when he appealed to the very important capacity of judgment as coming prior to and not depending on constitutional recognition for one's political standing. And when I invoke David Walker here, I mean his 1829 appeal, appeal to the colored citizens of the world, but in particular and very expressly of the United States. And one immediately has to raise the question, well, how are you using citizen in this title? Well, the answer has to do with the language of appeal. David Walker is trying to get us to see, as he refashions the meaning of citizenship, that its meaning is not wholly dependent on constitutional recognition. He was not only calling black people to see themselves in a certain light, but he was also reminding his white counterparts that they too appealed to this capacity when they contested the British crown. And so he was encouraging his audience to think of political standing as not in the final analysis, something that depends on constitutional affirmation, but as an outgrowth of our basic capacities to judge. You all okay? Am I doing okay for time? I'm good? Okay. Martin Luther King Jr. famously engaged in this reworking of language when he retells the story of the founders and when he makes black folks intended heirs of the ethical and political goods of the declaration. He knew it wasn't true. In each instance, they were imagining against the tide, confronting a world at variance with their visions, but nonetheless committed to the power of the new language they were offering. Although the imagination is at work among these faith holders, the resources of the imagination are not imaginary. To stick with the examples above, ideas about freedom, judgment, and the founders were already active within the culture. Following Kenneth Burke, for example, Ralph Ellison powerfully describes this as, quote, a form of symbolic action that operates by negating nature as a given and amoral condition, creating endless series of man-made and man-imagined possibilities, end quote. Faith in this regard is a reality for faith holders, for it orients them in space and moves them through time, influencing their ethical and political choices. This is why Ralph Waldo Emerson tells us that faith makes us and not we it, and faith makes its own forms. And Douglas understood this. Faith holders only long for the rest of their fellows to see its worth, its significance, and contribution to human flourishing. Faith, then, is a species of perfectionism, since the reworking of the language and the new vision of life imagined is put in place to enable again what Emerson calls ascension or the passage of the soul into higher forms. But the actions of the faith holders are also humbled by the fact that what they offer is dependent on those over whom they do not control and yet on whose actions they depend. This is partly why Douglas works so hard again and again and especially in the 4th of July address to shame and ridicule his audience attempting to move them to a position of moral rectitude. This is why King often uses America's love affair with the founders as a way of eliciting from them something the founders never intended or imagined. If we centralize dependence on our fellows and take seriously the absence of control, faith always bespeaks the uncertainty that saturates human experience. Uncertainty determines not merely the origin, but more critically the career of what is longed for, what we desire, love, and value. 
Faith thus involves a mixture of confidence that encourages self-assertion and yet sensitivity to uncertainty that demands, demands humility. So let me come on to these last claims. When Douglas appeals to the revolutionary spirit of 76, he's appealing to the logic of democratic legitimacy that is itself dependent on openness. Legitimacy is not a way of talking about adherence to a de facto polity, but a way of marking the principle of revision and invention that can connect what the polity is to what it may be and do so within the very boundary of the background norms with which the citizenry is familiar. Douglas is thus asking his fellows to channel the spirit of 76 so as to give life to a vision of themselves not yet in existence. And he is treating the people as not that thing finally specified by the Constitution, but as an aspiration struggling to inhabit the world. It is not, he explains in 1857, in changing the dead form of the Union that slavery is to be abolished in the country. Rather, it is in changing ourselves. Quote, slavery lives in this country not because of any paper constitution, but in the moral blindness of the American people who persuade themselves that they are safe, though the rights of others may be struck down, end quote. With some modifications to language, we could very well speak the sentiment today. Both in 1852, the Fourth of July address, and 1857, the engagement with Dred Scott, Douglas is asking his fellows to become the vision of themselves, he imagines, and he can do this by using the very principle of openness deployed by their parents to remake themselves in American society. When Douglas makes this move, he is refusing to concede ground on what this fragile experiment called American democracy is and who comprises it. There is insight here, I think. I'm often struck, I wanna be very careful when I say this, I'm often struck by claims that white supremacy is fundamental to the polity and that anti-blackness defines America. I'm struck not because these things are not true, they are, but because they are often presented as exhausting the traditions we find ourselves living. But when you accept this claim about what America really is, struggles against racial domination can only appear as external to, as alien to the polity. And they will, they will appear that way, rather than being seen as those parts of the richness and complexity of that life trying to win the day. This remains, I insist, a defining insight of Douglass's thinking. But Douglass does not merely see America as the object of his faith, whereas Delaney decided or decides to do otherwise. Douglass is not trying to offer a different historical narrative to combat Delaney, although he had some thoughts about the past as it related to slavery and anti-blackness. Rather, Douglas sees the full meaning of American democracy as exceeding the facts to which we could readily appeal, and, he ex and it exceeds the facts because the underlying logic of the polity carries with it the principle of openness that renders the meaning of who comprises the polity as an unsettled contested category. And this principle of openness also seems to fit with a view about humans as unsettled and unfolding creatures. Since we stand within rather than outside human affairs, the choices we make matter a great deal for bringing about progress or obstructing it altogether. So when Delaney decides, as he did in 1852, to collapse constituent power into constituted power, he denies not only himself, but American society a means of accounting for its own development, whether that development relates to race relations or some other matter. I tend to think that Sophia Nostrum, a political theorist, is right. The constitution of the people is not a historic event fixed in time once and for all. Rather, it is an ongoing claim that we make. And this underwrites the specific appeals we find historically excluded groups advancing throughout American history. We see it today. There is no way to make sense of the movement for black lives apart or independent of this account. Contra Delaney, this troubles the ease with which we treat those recognized by the Constitution as settled and instead allows us to bring those at the margins to the center of analysis in America's unfolding but contested ethical and political narrative. When Douglas speaks to the polity calling it to embrace new configurations of itself, he does so precisely under the specific logic of legitimacy. I'm inclined to say that we must do the same. So this emphasis on remaking and reinventing, my final point, and openness in the service of the future that I have emphasized in Douglas may give the impression that he means for us to turn away from the, the past, precisely the thing that I said wasn't the case at the beginning. 
And if I've given you that impression, I apologize. Douglas thinks too much about the past, and he agonizes over it, and our relationship to it, Douglas does not mean for us to break with the past. Rather, in James Baldwin's words, he wants us to enter into battle with oneself, with ourselves. He wants us to recreate ourselves according to a principle more humane and more liberating. And in doing so, we may just achieve a level of personal maturity and freedom which robs history of its tyrannical power and also changes the history we come to live. You know, we struggle to live together, I think, as democratic citizens, because we have not always understood the art of allowing portions of ourselves to die. What Douglas and Baldwin share, I think, is the belief that a democratic society is partly measured by the ability of its citizens to let go of their former selves as they quest after selves that are larger, more capacious, and more inclusive. We hear from all corners these days that the sun is setting on the American empire. This is as it should be. Every empire that has existed has left death and destruction in its wake. What we must ask ourselves now, the question that Douglas put to his fellows in his day, is what in our past might we retrieve for our present? How might those resources be reimagined to articulate a faith more humane and just than the reality we find ourselves living? And how might we allow portions of ourselves to die with grace so that we may live and grow with dignity? But answering this question requires us to begin as Douglas did with the idea that who we are as Americans need not finally determine who we may yet become. Thank you. I am April Alvarez, and I will moderate the question and answer session. Um, please raise your hand if you have a question, and the microphone will come to you. Hello, thank you for coming. Uh, my question for you is, if you were to resurrect Douglas, place him in your living room, and put Black Panther in front of him, what do you think his reactions or thoughts would be about the film? <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, uh, so, on the one hand, I think that um, the figure, the, the sort of villain, Killmonger, let's stick with him for a moment. Um, this is a character played by the actor Chadwick Boseman, right? Jordan. Michael B. Jordan. Michael B. Jordan, right. <laughs> um, uh, Chadwick plays uh, uh, Black Panther. Um, thanks. So, okay, so Michael B. Jordan. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this character is the way in which Kugler is trying in this movie to bring together two different elements. On the one hand, Killmonger is oriented by desire, um, it's freedom dreams. Um, he thinks that um, black and brown people, uh, peoples of the world uh, are dominated and he thinks that the fictional um, uh, a community in the movie, Wakanda, um, is responsible for abandoning um, the black and brown peoples of the world despite them having all of this technology, okay? Douglas was a defender of an idea of racial solidarity under conditions of domination. And so to that extent, I think Douglas would, would think, yes, right? No black person is free insofar as the system of racialized domination continues to structure the lives of black and brown people. But obviously, Douglas is going to disagree with the way in which uh, the figure of Killmonger wants to enact this through um, uh, um, uh, a tyranny um, uh, uh, and violence. And so that bit, he's not going to be able to obviously sign on, uh, sign on to. So I think he would have sort of mixed, he would have mixed feelings about this, right? But I do think that Douglas would actually raise a series of questions, as all in this tradition of African-American political thought often do. What is it about the society that we live in that may in fact distort our understanding of what freedom demands? 
And what's interesting about the fig figure of Killmonger, there's a, there's a scene in the movie where he has arrived in Wakanda, and they come to realize that he's Wakandan, and the CIA agent says, no, he's one of ours. And that move is quite important because what Killmonger goes on to narrate is that I have participated in the Iraq war, Afghanistan. He goes through a whole litany of uh, military activities uh, conducted by uh, uh, the West against um, uh, brown folks. And so what we come to realize is that his freedom dreams are read through the distorting lens of empire right, that uh, America enacts, and since he was left in America, that's all he has to figure out how freedom works, right? And isn't Douglas trying to distance us from the notion that the realization of freedom needs to turn on the domination of, and destruction of other peoples, right? So. I'm glad I've seen the movie five times. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I want to take a step back a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Referring to indigenous people, we're facing a very real struggle, of, and we have been facing a struggle of erasure. Um, and how do how should we respond? We've we've kept faith for a very long time. How should we respond to the m ever approaching threat of erasure? This is your home as well. You don't you don't concede ground on it. I mean, this is one of the deep disagreements that I have with this philosophical tradition known as Afro-pessimism. It concedes ground on the idea um, that this is home um, for black and brown folks in a deep way. Right? We helped build the country, right? And it also concedes ground on the po point that I was making earlier, um, that if you think about the narrative of America from the very beginning as a story always about contestation, then there's no good reason to believe right, that one thread of this story has a lock on the entirety right, of the tradition. Right? And so what you do is right, you engage in voice, you pick up that pen, and you get to the polls. Right? To just sort of right, re-invoke David's point um, from earlier. Right? And you hit the streets. Should I, I, hi. Hey. <laughs> um, thank you for that talk. That was really amazing. Um, so I, there's one thread of the uh, Afro-pessimist tradition that I'd like to hear you talk a bit about. Ta-Nehisi Coates talks about this, which is the question of uh, the economic dimensions of this um, mm -hmm. and the question of reparations. Um, and I was really struck by your line at the end about how uh, we have to think about a part of us dying with grace. I thought it was a really beautiful way to narrate that. And when we think about it ethically, in terms of people's investments in whiteness that are psychological, that are social, it's easier to imagine that dying. It's harder to imagine that dying in the context of the dimensions of property ownership yeah, right, well. in contemporary America. Um, and so I just w wanted to hear sort of your, your thoughts about that and, and how does that work in a kind of political economy sense, mm -hmm. as well as in an ethical, moral, right, sort of right. social sense. Right. Um, so, you know, you know, one of the things that Douglas had to say um, in the 1860s in his um, so pictures and progress, essays, lectures, um, but one of the things that he had to say there uh, the Douglas was really sort of narrating the um, sort of moral sentimental undercurrent to his appeals that he'd been making up until that point and will continue to go on to make. And much of what he emphasizes is the role of the poet, the artist, and the writer of sketching new um, configurations of society. Right? And often sketching those against the backdrop of what is, painting new pictures, right? I don't think it's insignificant that a good chunk of the abolitionist movement 
was involved in telling detailed stories about the horror of black life as a way to sort of paint pictures into which white Americans could be implotted so that they could see precisely the sort of nature and details of the cruelty that was being inflicted on black bodies and that in turn denoted right, their inability right, or their refusal to honor the commitments that they otherwise take themselves to hold. What would it mean to partly engage in that project now, right, with respect to a reconfiguration of the political economic structure of the society that we inhabit, right? What would it mean to sort of pers to, to try to paint pictures of what poverty looks like, um, of what homelessness looks like, right? I don't think that that can be the only method. Right? We actually need some political actors who wield power on the side of this, right? Um, who actually uh, are passing legislation. But I think these things, um, we need to sort of think about the, uh, the sort of various um, approaches uh, that one could take um, to, try, to try to do this, right? Um, and some of this will have to take place and, um, uh, and I don't mean this in terms of the election, so that's not the argument I'm making. Um, but in persuading some of, a good number of our black and brown folks, uh, excuse me, our, our white counterparts, that some of their own uh, economic oppression is tied to this very system um, that also <laughs> contributes to, um, that's, not, that's not why Trump won, but, but I think we should be interested in trying to paint that narrative uh, as well. Thank you very much for your talk. I would like to hear the talk five times like you've studied Black <laughs> Panther. Um, I'm interested in some of the framework that you set up talking about that, that we can't look at American history as just a history of white supremacy and, and anti-blackness or the resistance to that. Um, if not so hypothetically speaking, one was engaged in a project looking at the history of the state of Oregon and its history of white supremacy and resistance, what advice would you give for people engaged in that kind of history? And sort of what cautions would you give if we're looking at both of those things um, for a particular history? How do we go about doing that in a way that's really useful for folks? Does that make sense? I don't quite know. Mm. Uh, in other words, I, I understand, I, I think I understand what you laid out. Yeah. But I'm just not quite sure what you really want from, from me in terms of this comment. So. Because it sounds like you're doing something, so that, that's right. what I'm yeah. saying. Okay. I'm like, how do we do it really well, I think is the question, right? Because I think what you're saying is don't choose, maybe I want to understand if I heard you correctly, because maybe I just heard what I hope to hear, right? Okay. So what I hope to hear you say is don't choose one side or the other of these things when you look at the history of the United States or Oregon or wherever you're, you're looking, right? But look at both of them and, and look at the complexity of that. Or are you saying don't look at it this way at all? Maybe? No, I think that these two sides that I sketched are each engaged in their own specific vindicationist projects. Uh -huh. One is engaged in the, the vindicationist pro project to say, see, in fact, we have advanced. And they are so wedded to this as part of our own sort of mythos. They're wedded to this that actually obstructs or arrests their ability to see that this idea of progress has, has, in, has in fact happened for some and not for others. And that actually points still to the, the deeper persistence, persistent problem of white supremacy. But I think then on the other side, there are those who somewhat oddly, I think, who on the one hand, wants to, they want to reject um, the notion of um, uh, progress as a kind of metaphysical property of the American polity, only then to turn to the claim that we haven't moved anywhere, right? And, 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 and that's because each are actually trying to vindicate this prior position that, uh, that they have, right? And so I think, you know, my aim, the stuff that I've been working on, I try to sort of avoid um, these moves all, all together, right? Um, uh, I'm trying to sort of understand what figures like Douglas and Ida B. Wells and David Walker and Jane Baldwin, how they sort of understood what they were doing in their struggles and, and what for them had to be the case 
about democracy in order to justify their constant appeals. In other words, what is the philosophical normative story that they are working on that can help us understand their constant attempt to engage? So that's my project, but I, do, but I, but I think this, this resistance to these vindicationist stories, I mean, I just think that this has to be, I mean, we have to put this to, to, to the side, or if you want to be a vindicationist, then you just need to, you need to be honest about it. And that's another thing, right? Folks are not being honest about what they're, about what they're doing, right? And that, that, cons that concerns me a great deal. Right? Yeah. Um, I'm going, this is a lot on it, okay. I'm gonna assume that you've seen the film Get Out. I have seen them, what, what, I'm not having comments on the movie, but <laughs> okay, uh, on the, subject of contemporary African-American filmmaking. Uh, so you mentioned that today a president moral blindness is. Um, now I want to know your response to the objectification of the black body as portrayed in Get Out, which is slightly different in than the perceived moral superiority that we see today. Right. Um. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Um, I know, right? The political theories. Are, um. So there's a weird, my reading of, of Get Out, sort of, but there's a weird eroticism to Get Out, right? To inhabit um, uh, the black place, right? The black space that then adorns the white subject with a kind of a kind of coolness, a kind of right. Um, and that turns on this sort of erotic relationship um, that is being described in the movie in which the, the white folks that are there are actually meant to be sort of metaphors for a certain kind of white liberal, right? Um, this does not have the same trope as, um, as the hierarchy, but it does still carry the same trope as domination and control. So I think the trope of, I think the theme of domination and control continues to sort of proceed throughout this, but in a very different, but in a very different register than the sort of standard hierarchy. So that's all I got. I got much more. Okay. Over here. Thank you, Melvin. Uh, that was a very rich and, and far-reaching talk. I wanted to ask you about um, just one part of it that might be peripheral, but I, I hope you'll sort of be able to clarify this. You mentioned at the beginning, um, you raise the idea of a ontology kind of bound up with modernity right. that necessitates the sort of distinction uh, of, of the other right. and seem to me at least to suggest that it necessitates some, some kind of domination or, or uh, mm -hmm. oppression. Um, I, I was hoping you'd be able to spell that out and suggest what, I, it, it, uh, I thought maybe that suggests that something about the enlightenment tradition or um, the tradition out of which, say, you know, modern liberal politics emerges is sort of bound up with oppression, and that, that was surprising to me. I was, I was wondering if you could yeah, spell that Yeah, well, well I, remember at that moment, I was sort of describing the position of the Afro-pessimist, right? Okay. Um, so I wasn't describing my own uh, position, and most certainly wasn't describing the position of Douglas. Um, and of course, this is a story about uh, a certain way in which anti-blackness and the Enlightenment project sort of runs simultaneously alongside each other, um, that the workings of the African slave trade and the necessity to both justify um, the enslavement of black folks while simultaneously holding on to one's commitments to equality and equal, uh, um, so equal standing and freedom um, necessitates some kind of background description that one is going to offer up to sort of account for these two, for these two moments. Um, and so the Afro-pessimist proposes this story about ontology in which the sort of dark other, the other that is um, whose cognitive abilities are less than, uh, whose beauty is less than, and therefore makes them um, unfit for freedom and equality, actually turns out to be the thing that helps them understand what freedom and what equality actually looks like in their eyes. In other words, those things can be conceptualized apart from, right? So we, we think of, uh, um, uh, in historical terms, we might think of Edmund Morgan's, uh, um, I'm forgetting the title of that, Virginia, the, there you go, there you go, from the historian. So, um, 
So Edmund Morgan right, makes this kind of argument, but, but philosophers advance this argument obviously at a much, at, 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 a, uh, uh, at a higher philosophical, at a higher philosophical level. I don't know what to uh, do with, I'm a pragmatist philosophically, so I don't know what to do with ontology talk. Um, I just don't know how one gets a handle or something that actually is the sort of, uh, the sort of permanent feature of um, the world we live, a human permanent feature, and yet somehow is thought to be independent of what human action and response does in relation to it. Th those things just don't make much, doesn't make much sense to me. Um, I'm not saying that it couldn't be right, I just don't see, I just don't see a way to get to its, its rightness, so I tend to think it might be mistaken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I wanted to welcome your use of Douglas as a counter to Afro-pessimism. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's your way of using Douglas in the present, but it also seems to, to me a way of using Douglas that is fair and accurate to his thought. Uh, I wondered if you could say a little bit more about this topic of refashioning and openness. Uh, you described what Douglas is doing as a species of perfectionism. Does that mean that he has some conception of the perfect? In other words, is this just openness or is there some end point? And if there's an end point, what's the foundation for that end point? I guess I'm asking you to say something more about his analysis of the past and is his vision of the end point anything other than his understanding of what is logically entailed by the Declaration of Independence? Right, um, I, so, so he's not, uh, he's not going to be an Aristotelian perfectionist in my mind. I, I tend to think that the American version of this is uh, less static, it is more flexible. Perfectionism is supposed to be denotative of a certain kind of orientation toward the dynamism of the world such that we can receive it in its proper way and respond to it in its proper way. And, and when I say receive it in its proper way and respond to it in its proper way, I mean by that um, engaging with the environment such that we are, in, we are able to move on in more fruitful ways in our, in our socializing with other human beings um, in, the realization of, in the realization of our goals. So I tend to think that he's, a, sort, of, he's sort of perfectionist in uh, that respect. The, the content of his perfectionism, the vision of faith, um, has as its, as its ground, you're right, the Declaration of Independence, and it has as its ground um, obviously natural rights, but I won't be found in my reading of Douglas speaking about natural rights in the way that I think Nick might want to speak about natural rights. And what do I mean by that? For Douglas, um, he believes in something like natural rights, but it's very important to keep in mind that he realizes that natural rights, just like his invocation of God itself, is not self-actuating. It's not self-executing. And so if it's not self-actuating or self-executing, then the emphasis moves from constantly talking about natural rights to talking about how it is I can get my fellows to fall in love with this description right, of themselves as free and equal, um, as having a fundamental dignity, right? And if that's the move, then once they fall in love, as Douglas imagines it, right, then it actually doesn't really matter if this thing that we're calling natural rights really emanates from nature or if in fact something like a God finally exists. What really will matter is that they will have decided to live their life in the light of it, right? And that's my, this is sort of my reading of, uh, uh, of, of Douglas. And keep in mind, living one's life in the light of it means that it has saturated and oriented one's character so much so that it becomes very difficult to understand oneself apart from it. But we could actually speak that way about human beings, and we often do, right, without saying that the reason why they are finally like that is because they've gotten in right relationship with the way in which natural rights mean for them uh, to live their life. Like we, can, uh, we can sort of put that, right? So, I, so that's, my, that's my gloss, right? But it may be my, uh, concede this, it may be my pragmatism doing too much work on Douglas. Uh, thank you, Melvin, fascinating uh, talk. I, I'm fascinated by that story you tell of Martin Delaney getting kicked out of uh, Howard, Harvard. I want to ask sort of the intersection of personal experience and the formation of political philosophy. And, and did that experience trigger sort of a profound loss of faith in this country for Delaney? Did that experience turn him to 
towards immigration and 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 how uh, sort of how we process personal experience to that sort of higher level of ideology and political philosophy? Um, I, I mean, I think the answer is yes, right? Um, um, I think Delaney is devastated by the Harvard decision. I think he's devastated by uh, the fugitive slave law. And those things mingle together, as I said, to make him think, oh, I don't know about this nation. Now, I want to be very clear, right, sort of uh, to all of the historians in the room. I'm focusing on 1852. We know um, that in 1860s, he's, he comes back, right? He comes back from living in Canada, I think. Um, he now is recruited into um, uh, uh, the Union uh, Army, and he actually serves. And um, I think he may have been the, the, the first uh, black, black, black American to hold a commission office, uh, I think. Um, uh, um, and so that suggests me, he was thinking to himself, oh, wait, this might mean something else, right? So I'm, I'm, but I'm focusing deliberately. Um, in 1852, because I think it marks such a critical moment for Delaney, and it is a moment that even when he changed his mind, came to echo throughout time, whether we talk about Marcus Garvey, or whether we talk about the early Malcolm X, or whether we talk about this sort of new uh, rise in the Afro-pessimistic uh, uh, Afro -pessimistic tradition. And of course, Douglas himself also had these moments of, right, um, uh, um, you know, after, um, uh, uh, the Civil War, he's like, yes, look, finally. Uh, then the collapse of Reconstruction, he's like, see, I knew it, they never was, you know. Um, <laughs> and we see this moment throughout many figures in this tradition. Ida B. Wells has a moment like this. We know Du Bois has uh, a moment. Baldwin has this moment, he leaves, and then he comes back, and he's wondering where he should really be. King seemed to have been moving toward um, moving in that in 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 that direction, right? Um, uh, and it, of course, it raises concerns about how long can one really um, sustain a faith. And of course, that then folds back to Delaney. And Delaney's final question, a question that still I think could be put to us today, and actually against Douglas, is how many how many more lives, black lives, do you really want to sacrifice for your white counterparts to become something other than what they seem to be? in their conduct, other than what they seem to be uh, in, their, in their practices toward you. Um, and if, at the end of the day, one is really concerned with black lives, we have to confront Delaney's question again and again. Right? Um, Melvin, this is a brilliant talk. A quick question for you. Um, and it depends on how one would define a pragmatist, as you know, but mm -hmm. is a pragmatist almost inherently hopeful. If you're a true, pra I mean, in the Jamesian, the real pragmatist sense, so, uh, yeah, so, so isn't there an inherent hope in it? There, there is an inherent uh, sense um, that conditions that we find ourselves in um, uh, can be relatively uh, improved. Um, there is this sense that, on the pragmatist account, that precisely because the life that we find ourselves living, the institutions we find ourselves moving through, are what they are because of the human beings that, um, uh, that live them and inhabit them, um, and that living that life and inhabiting those institutions turns out simply to be right, a function of a set of habits that we have that define who we are, um, habits can be learned and they can be unlearned. The question for the pragmatist is, might there nonetheless be institutional goods, psychological goods that accrue to inhabiting that particular identity and inhabiting that particular institution, thus raising the concern of how do you de-incentivize people right, from seeing um, white supremacy as a good? Right? And I should say that some days you, you caught me on a good day. On some days I think, nope, I don't think there's anything. Because, and I, I say to my students sometimes, if it is the case that I were, I were white and I, in fact, all of the, enjoyed all of these goods that attached to it, I don't know if I would willingly want to dispense with it. In other words, the question is, are the goods of a racially just society right, as psychologically ennobling as materially ennobling as the, old, as, the, 
as the darker other side, right, or underside, right? And, you know, given the political economy question, I, I struggle. So today you caught me on that. Yeah, I think the other side is actually stronger. Um, uh, you caught me on that on a Douglas day, so. Could I just ask a quick question? I'm over here. Oh, oh, uh, oh okay, oh. sorry. <laughs> what, uh, what do you think the most successful multiracial country in world history is, and what accounts for its success? I have no clue. I, I really don't have any, I, I really have no, I, I really have no answer. This is actually one of the criticisms of this new book I'm working on, that I, that I stay local, that I seem not to look beyond the United States, that I, as, as, as one of my, my colleagues says, you're too provincial, you don't look at the diaspora, and I was like, I, I, I'm, I'm guilty, you know, um, so, so I don't, so, say it again? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, okay. I'm sure all of you can offer up some, uh, <laughs> you won't get any from me, so I'm just like, trying to, but anyway. Thanks for being here. Ah, great. Thank you. Thank you.